Quick question, do you know how long it takes for a mountain to move? Obviously, it's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? Because moving around is not something the mountains are really known for. The only reason that this would happen is because of shifting plate tectonics, driving them up within a process called uplift. As the Indian tectonic plate dries itself into the Eurasian plate, the mountains are slowly getting taller and creeping up toward the sky. But not by much. Mount Everest is estimated to be growing at a grand total of about 4 millimeters per year. Other parts of the Himalayas are growing faster, but still only about 10 millimeters a year. And not only that, but erosion mitigates this growth, so Everest's net uplift is really only about 2 millimeters. And to the naked eye, the mountain hasn't budged since Hillary and Norgay summited in 1953. Seeing mountains move is just not something that you expect to see in your lifetime. Unless, unless you happen to live in North Korea. Mount Mantap is a 2,200 meter peak in the northwest of the Korean peninsula, and since 2017, it has shifted by no less than three and a half meters horizontally. It has also changed height by about 50 centimeters downward. By contrast, it's estimated that Everest has grown upward by about 15 to 50 meters in the last 89,000 years. So, big question: What the fuck's going on? All right, so first a bit about North Korea, although if you've been a fan of the channel for some time or pay attention to the news or life, then you already know a thing or two about North Korea, don't you? Everybody more or less agrees that North Korea, a bit of a rogue state capable of malevolent actions of various types. And if you followed some of our other videos, then you might also know a thing or two about Juche, the pseudo-religion attributed to Kim Il-sung in which he and his dynasty feature as central figures. Well, Juche places quite a large symbolic emphasis on North Korea's many mountains, which, being rugged, immovable, and hard to conquer, are used as metaphors for qualities espoused by the state ideology. Basically, the natural strength of the mountains reflects the Juche idea that the Korean people must be strong and resilient against foreign domination. They therefore occupy a strong position in North Korean iconography. The state's tallest mountain, Mount Paekdu, is so revered that it can be found on the national state emblem and referenced in the state anthem with the words, and in the spirit of Mount Paekdu, with the love of toil that shall never die, with a will of iron fostered by the truth, will lead the whole world by and by. It has even been mythicized that Kim Il-sung fought the Japanese on the slopes of the mountain during their occupation of Korea, and that his son and successor, Kim Jong-il, was born on Mount Paektu's slopes. Neither story is true. Kim Il-sung did fight the Japanese, but as part of a guerrilla band operating in Manchuria, today a part of China. He only returned to Korea in 1945, several months after the Japanese had been defeated from his exile in the Soviet Union, where his son was actually born. But. You understand the point here. Mountains are, by way of Juche, very important to North Korea, but uh, apparently not all of them. Because one peak wound up playing host to the most notorious form of ecological destruction known to man, the testing of nuclear weapons. It was Mount Mantap, located in the province of North Hamyong, which drew the short straw. Mount Mantap, or Mantap San, stands at about 2200 meters or 7200 feet, making it the third tallest mountain in North Korea. And between 2006 and 2017, it withstood no less than six separate nuclear tests carried out in its immediate environs. The consequences of these for the mountain were immense, as Mantap has been observed to be showing signs of so-called tired mountain syndrome. More on that in just a little bit. Now, of course, the mountain is not the only nearby casualty of the regime, as the region in which it is located is abundant with human suffering too. Bordering Mantap is the colony of Kwan Li So 16, better known as Hua Song, the largest concentration camp in North Korea and one of the most infamous in the world. Now, not a whole lot is known about Hua Song, but it is suspected to be surreptitiously linked to another nearby oddity and the source of all of Mount Mantap's ills, the Pungiri nuclear test site the only known such site in North Korea. Now, obviously, nuclear weapons tests can come at a steep cost to human, animal, and plant life anywhere in the nearby vicinity. For this region, the choice of location cannot be anything other than scrupulous, careful, and deliberate. The US and the Soviet Union, for example, possessed wide-open expanses wherein these tests could be carried out safely, and despite their isolation, it was often still not enough 
The first nuclear tests were carried out by the United States in the Arizona wilderness, but winds managed to carry radioactive debris over hundreds of miles, affecting the health of people in nearby states like Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. These later became known as the Downwinders. Later, testing was shifted to Bikini Atoll in the Pacific, which wound up rendering the reef completely uninhabited. In the Soviet Union, nuclear tests were carried out in sparsely populated Kazakhstan and still managed to fry the earth at Semipalatinsk and Baikonur to such a degree that hazards remain for locals to this day. Well, North Korea certainly doesn't have anything like the space that was available to the United States and the Soviet Union, which are, you know, really big. At 46,000 square kilometers or 120,000 square miles, the territory of the entire country is about equal in size to the US state of Pennsylvania. So there really aren't a huge amount of places available for it to carry out the environmentally devastating nuclear tests without steep cost to its economic and citizen health. But adding the nuclear bomb to the state armory was a long-time ambition of practically every generation of Kim, and the state decided to push forward with the idea anyway. Part of the reason Mount Mantap was chosen for this dubious honor may have been because of the abundance of free labor nearby. The Hwasong camp is commonly believed to have been established for political undesirables sometime in the 1990s, although some satellite images suggest that it was in operation already by 1983. By the time the nuclear test rolled around, Amnesty International estimated the camp to have a population of 20,000 prisoners, both undesirables and their families. The labor, previously mining, timber, and agricultural endeavors, could easily be converted into nuclear development. Decades of murky weapons deals had also provided the DPRK with the know-how to set up a nuclear test, largely by way of an arrangement with Pakistan in the 1980s, which saw North Korean missiles exchanged for intel on uranium enrichment, the key step toward building a nuclear bomb. In 1993, North Korea announced its intention to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, leading to a diplomatic crisis with the United States, which was only resolved by a fragile continuation agreement the following year. But by 2003, the state was ready to begin testing. So, it abandoned the treaty, becoming the only country to date to leave the NPT umbrella. Pyongyang was ready to kickstart its nuclear program. Now, all they needed was a test site. Now, of course, whatever location was chosen was likely to bring devastating consequences on the health of local residents, something especially true in the case of North Korea, given the spatial constraints that we mentioned before, being the site of Pennsylvania and all that. But this probably wasn't the greatest concern for Kim Jong-il and co. Much greater may have been the threat of outside intervention. You see, even the USSR couldn't hide its nuclear machinations from the West in the 1950s. A small country like North Korea, with the eyes of the entire world trained on it no less, was even unlikelier to be able to do so. And this could prove problematic, since the Kims had spent a long time telling the world that nuclear testing was exactly what they were not planning to do. Moreover, the same year North Korea pulled out of the NPT in 2003, reports of weapons of mass destruction led the US to carry out a ground invasion of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Best then if the tests could be carried out somewhere inconspicuous, somewhere hidden, somewhere underground. That was when nuclear engineers took another look at Mount Mantap and thought, that's a bit of a pointless mountain, isn't it? Why not just do our nuclear tests underneath that thing? And so the Pungiri nuclear test site on Mount Mantap came into being. Now, given the strict secrecy of North Korea, it's not quite clear exactly when the test site came into being, although declassified satellite imagery seems to suggest excavation dating back to the 1980s. This would figure, since it was around that time that the Hwasong camp was being built, since it was also around that time that North Korea began harvesting nuclear designs and technology from Pakistan. But what is known for certain is when the first nuclear test shook Mantap Mountain, and that was the 9th of October 2006. The test was a partial success, or fizzle, and five more tests took place in the coming years, in 2009, 2013, two in 2016, and most recently in 2017. North Korea announced the second 2016 detonation to be its first successful test of a nuclear warhead, or one that could be mounted onto a ballistic missile. CIA intelligence revealed that the testing took place in two underground tunnels at Pungiri Tunnel 1, the East Portal, and Tunnel 2, the North Portal. The analytical website 38 North added that the East Portal was used only for Test 1 and then abandoned, probably due to contamination, with the subsequent five tests all taking place in the North Portal. There was also a third tunnel, the South Portal, where analysts concluded excavation was abandoned in 2013. 
and further satellite images provided more revelations, including several spoil piles for nuclear waste, as well as a command center located around six kilometers from Pungiri. Also located nearby were several civilian towns, although it has been theorized that these were abandoned following severe flooding in the 1980s. Meanwhile, seismic data was able to provide a rough estimate of the size of the detonations themselves. These ranged from an initial blast in 2006 of around 0.7 kilotons of TNT equivalent to around 25 kilotons by the time of the second test in 2016. The 2017 test, which involved a hydrogen bomb, was by far the most powerful at 250 kilotons. But this still paled in comparison with other historic nuclear tests. The most powerful nuclear test in history, the Tsar Bomber, was carried out by the Soviet Union in 1961 and came in at 50 megatons. That's 200 times stronger than the most powerful of the Pungiri blasts. In fact, the combined size of all the detonations would still only make North Korean testing a footnote in the history of such endeavors, with the six blasts collectively amounting to less than 0.1% of total nuclear test yield since 1945. Even so, there isn't really any such thing as a minor nuclear weapons test. The 2017 detonation was estimated to have caused an earthquake tremor of around 6.1 on the earthquake magnitude scale, according to seismic data gathered by China. This would make it comparable in force to the quake that shook Afghanistan in August 2025 and left around 1,500 people dead at the time of writing. And then, all of a sudden, the Pungiri test site was shut down in May 2018. This was possibly due to a thaw in relations with the United States at that time, or possibly because the tests had already yielded satisfactory results. Either way, Pyongyang's adversaries, not least South Korea, issued a great sigh of relief at the sight of satellite images of Pungiri being dismantled. It seemed as if disaster had been averted. But disaster had likely already been occasioned. Mount Mantap was showing signs of peculiar behavior, some that would indicate that the land fared very ill indeed. On September 3, 2017, various international seismic monitoring systems caught a 4.6 magnitude earthquake-like event occurring on Mount Mantap, directly above the Pungiri test site. They might say, well, no mystery there, it was the sixth nuclear test, plain and simple, which took place that same day. But actually it wasn't. The quake took place eight minutes after the test had been completed, which we know because the test had, on its own, created the aforementioned 6.1 degree seismic tremor. Eight minutes in seismology is more than enough for this to have been a completely separate event. But in reality, they weren't so separate after all. It was later believed that the second tremor, which baffled scientists, resulted from an area above the test site collapsing into a cavity created by the bomb, all of it deep within the mountain. How many people this killed, we don't know, but probably quite a lot. But what came next was even stranger. According to multiple sources, more tremors occurred in the weeks that followed, including one a week after the blast, which caused a tunnel collapse and killed around 100 people, according to a Japanese broadcaster. Another collapse shortly afterward brought the suspected death toll to around 200 people. More collapses followed over winter and into the spring, all of which resulted in Pungyuri being more or less unusable by the time North Korea graciously announced it would shut the site down. And that wasn't the only sign that the mountain was in poor health. High-resolution satellite images revealed that the mountain was no longer the same shape that it had been before. It had bulged sideways more than three meters and flattened vertically by about half a meter. Expert analysis also helped pinpoint the location of the blast on the mountainside, about 1,500 feet or 500 meters below the summit. This had caused the mountain to temporarily blow outward before melting or vaporizing the rock inside and around the tunnels. The implication of this was obvious. The mountain was geologically tired, its rocks now brittle, its soil permeable, easily penetrated by toxic gases, and too fractured and unstable to support any further safe testing. Not that the word safe had applied to the North Korean tests in the first place. Scattered accounts of the human toll of the tests painted a devastating picture. The Telegraph cited an unnamed defector's account that deformed babies were being born in the hospitals near the test site. Another source claimed that underground wells had dried up after the sixth test, imperiling those unfortunate enough to be dependent on them for water, and that practically no warning or protection was offered to locals in the face of the blasts. Only the families of soldiers, Kim Jong-un's key support base, had been evacuated to safe zones underground. Residents were also reportedly banned from making hospital appointments in Pyongyang, and anyone caught boarding trains with samples of local soil or water would be immediately sent to concentration camps. 
effects on defectors, told NBC News that the deformed babies would be quickly killed by their own parents, while rates of leukemia and other cancers in the surrounding country skyrocketed in the wake of the blast. And it was further reported that nearby flora and fauna had not escaped the consequences of the nuclear bomb either, with accounts of trout dying in mountain streams and local species of mushrooms disappearing overnight. In the meantime, North Korea seems to have shelved its nuclear program, but unfortunately, that might not last very long. Shortly after the conclusion of the testing, further satellite images seemed to suggest that a fourth tunnel, the West Portal, was in the process of being excavated on Mount Mantab. The BBC also reported that reparation works on the closed test site seemed to be beginning, and the International Atomic Energy Agency reported that North Korea seemed to be restarting operations at the Young Beyond nuclear reactor, where plutonium for nuclear weapons had previously been produced. And in 2022, North Korea seemed to be scaling back the ceiling of the South Portal Tunnel with the addition of a new entrance, something which seemed to ominously suggest the beginning of new planned tests. If this is true, what it may mean for the mountain, not least the people inhabiting the area nearby it, may be even worse than anything that ever came before. <laughs>